You're going to turn with me to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, the secret, the secret to a victorious life. Stand for the reading of the word. Tony just recited a part of it. The secret to the victorious life, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may provide what is good and acceptable and perfect to the will of God. For I say to you, the grace given to me, to everyone, is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Father, we have a wonderful Lord God, Lord, exhortation here that can bring tremendous victory to our life. You have not called us, Lord God, to live as victims. That's the world. We see it all around us. We see it in the political realm, in the educational realm, in the athletic realm. Lord, you've called us to be victors in Christ Jesus, to live victoriously every day, to be overcomers and to be more than conquerors, as your word says. Teach us your ways, O Lord my God, that we would walk in your truth and that we would walk, Lord God, as victors in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So we have a choice to live as victors or victims. I want you to look at, at just four things here that we're going to be looking at, and this is going to be part one of, of three parts on these three verses. The first is your focus. What you focus on will determine whether you live victoriously or you live like a victim. Okay, what you focus on is going to determine whether you are a victor or a victim. Secondly, your body. Believe it or not, the way you use your body, how you use your body, what you use your body for is going to determine whether you're living like a victim or a victor. Your mind. What you think about and what you think about most, most consistently, will determine whether you are living like a victim or a victor. And then your actions, the things that you do, the things you act upon, will determine whether you're living as a victor or a victor, a uh, victim or a victor. So, again, part one: the secret to a victorious life. Hey, let me just say something to you. I, in coming to Christ, I refuse to live like a victim. I refuse it. I'm not going to walk around and whine and complain and, you know, think that the world has, has you know, treated me badly or God has treated me bad. I, I refuse to act like a victim. We are victors in Christ. We are more than conquerors in Christ. And I think we, we, we fight for victory, but we actually fight from victory. So we're going to focus here, again, in the next three weeks about the secret to a victorious life. First thing I want to focus on with you right now, in view of God's mercy. And that's where it all begins. In view of God's mercy, Romans chapter 12, verse 1, the NIV puts it this way, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, or in view of God's mercies. What do you focus on? Do you focus on God's mercies. Because whatever you focus on enlarges in your life. I hope you understand that. Whatever you focus on the most consistently is expanding in your life. If you uh, focus on, uh, on problems, if you focus on uh, anxiety, if you focus on worries, if you focus on problems, if you focus on... They're going to enlarge in your life. If you focus on the Lord, if you focus on his peace, his love, his joy, then that is going to expand in your life. But what you focus on most consistently, what you habitually think about, okay, whether negative or positive, that is what is going to expand in your life. Jesus said, okay, for he who has will be given... You know what, that's a common thing. For he who has will be given more. Whatever you have, whatever you are focusing on, you're going to get more of. It's just going to manifest in your life. So in, in Matthew chapter 6, 22 through 23, it says, The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? You've heard the, 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 the saying that essentially the eye is the, is the doorway to the soul, right? The eye is the, it, it's essentially the doorway to the soul. And what the Word of God is saying here, if you are focused on darkness, you're going to be filled with darkness. If you're focused on light, you're going to be filled with light. If you're focused on fear, if you're focused on worries, 
Again, if you're focused on problems, if you're focused on sin, that's just going to manifest. You're going to get more and more and more of it in your life. If you're focused on the Lord, if you're focused on his love, his peace, his joy, his righteousness, if you're focused on his faith, that is what is going to manifest in your life. The eye is the doorway to the soul. In Proverbs 23, 7, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. So here is the picture of a man who throws a party. And he puts out, you know, steaks, he puts out hors d'oeuvres, he puts out the salad, he puts out all the good food. And the people come and eat. And he says, hey, have a great time. Here, I've thrown a party for you. Have fun. Enjoy all the food. And while you're eating, he's looking at you and going, man, that guy just ate a $20 steak. Can you believe that? He just gobbled that thing down. And, 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 and look at, look at the, he, just, he, just, he, just, he just drank, he just drank like a gallon of that expensive soup. And he's looking over and saying, hey, that guy just ate all the expensive cannolis. I can't believe that. You ever see people like that? You know, they got, they got a fake smile on. They got the fake face on. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, 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 have fun. Have, you know, have a good time. And the whole time, they're begrudging you having that. They're fakes. They're fakes. The true him, okay? The true him, he's a, he's a stingy, greedy person. And God looks at the heart. He doesn't look at the outward appearance. He looks, he looks at the heart. And what he's really thinking, what he's really focused on, okay, is his selfishness, is his greed, for as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. What do you think about? What do you think about most? Again, in view of God's mercy. Because whatever you focus on enlarges. It enlarges in your mind, it enlarges in your heart, it enlarges in your soul. Whatever you think about most consistently, it enlarges. Think about negative stuff and enlarges. Think about darkness and enlarges. Think about sin and enlarges. Think about love, think about compassion, think about kindness, goodness, favor, the mercies of God. What are the mercies of God? And what, what the Apostle Paul has done, when we come to chapter 12, verse 1, he has been talking from chapter 1 to chapter 11 all about the mercies of God. It, it's, been one, it's been one chapter after another talking about all the mercies of God. So let me talk to you about that for a few minutes. In view of God's mercy, Romans chapter 1, and, 1 through 3. What the scripture says, we are all sinners. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Whether you're a Jew or whether you're a Gentile, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And God has sent his mercy upon us. He sent Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior. And he came and he died for unworthy people, people who were undeserving. He poured out his mercy upon us. He is our substitutionary atonement. He hung on the cross six hours that Friday and he took your hell upon himself so that you would never have to experience hell. The mercies of God. He died for sinners. It was our sins that nailed him to the cross. It was my sins that nailed him to the cross. It was my sin that put him on the cross. And he took our sins upon himself. That is the mercies of God. How about his amazing grace? We were sinners, yet again, Christ died for us. God's mercies speak about his grace, his, his unearnable favor, his unmerited, okay, grace. All the works in the world cannot earn it. All the religious gymnastics cannot buy it. All the rituals cannot obtain it. He purchased, right? He purchased his, our very salvation by his blood and what he did on the cross. And that is his grace. It is free. It is undeserving. It is unearnable. We're helpless to save ourselves. We're hopeless to save ourselves. And it is by God's grace that we can be saved. Romans 8 talks about the outpouring of the Spirit. The mercy of the outpouring of the Spirit. He has given us His Spirit. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. He has come and He indwells us. And He transforms us spiritually. He takes us from being dead to being alive. You know, some people think, well, Jesus came to make bad people good. No, He came to make dead people alive. We were spiritually dead. And he came and he died for us and he poured his spirit out into us. And he gives us spiritual life. I don't know about you, but before Jesus came into my life, I didn't care about God's will. I didn't care about God's ways. I didn't care about God's word. I didn't care about God's son. You couldn't get me to sit in church. I didn't want to be bothered with God. And suddenly the Holy Spirit came into me 
that, that, that January night when I got down on my knees and I prayed to take Christ into my heart and suddenly I was transformed and I had an interest in God's word. I had an interest in doing God's will. I had an interest in God's way, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I had a passion for him and his word. In Romans chapter 1, 2, 5, and 8, we have been given peace with God. The mercies of the Lord is his peace. He has given us peace. We are no longer his enemies. We are no longer in opposition to him. Instead of rejecting him, instead of rebelling against him, instead of resisting him, we have received him into our life and now we have been reconciled to him and we have peace with him from the Lord. In Romans chapter 5, it talks about his mercy clothing us with righteousness. Romans 5 says that we have been covered, our sins have been covered, our filthy rags, okay, have been covered with these robes that are as pure as white, perfect snow on a beautiful winter morning. And when God looks at us, he no longer sees my sins, he sees Jesus and Jesus' righteousness. In the Ten Commandments, it says, thou shalt not steal, have you ever stolen? The Ten Commandments say, Thou shalt honor thy father and mother. Has anybody here ever dishonored their father and mother? The Ten Commandments say, Thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. Has anybody here ever blasphemed? How about, how about lied? Thou shalt not lie. Or coveted. Or, or a, a, a lusted with adultery. Right? Just, we, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But Jesus came and he lived a perfect life. Jesus never lied. Jesus never stole. stole. Jesus never blasphemed. Jesus never took the name of the Lord in vain. Jesus never coveted. Jesus honored his mother and father perfectly. And he is the perfect sacrifice. So when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, God looks at you and he no longer sees all your sins. He sees Jesus. He has covered us with his righteousness. And that is a part of his mercies. Romans says that we have been reconciled. Romans chapter 5. His mercies again have reconciled us to him. We were in opposition to him. We were his enemies. But he brought us into a relationship, a reconciliation, a relationship of love. We are now called his children. We're called his sons. We're called his friends. His mercies have given us freedom. Freedom. We have been set free from sin. We have been set free from sin's penalty and sin's power. We have been set free from the power of Satan. Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 6, verse 8. Over and over again, we have been set free from the power of sin and the power of Satan. Romans chapter 8. His mercy has made us children of God. And we can cry, Abba, Father. That's, that's saying, Daddy. Daddy. That we can have this intimate, rich relationship with God our Father, this wonder-filled relationship with Him. And we can call Him Abba. And He calls us with a, a word of affection, my child. In Romans chapter 1, His mercies have given us comfort. Romans chapter 1 verse 12, He has given us comfort in our trials, in our tribulations, in our pain, and in our suffering. He's given us comfort. And, and you know, there's sometimes when people come up to you, you know, you're going through a hard time and they tap you on the back and they say, hey, you know what, it's going to be okay. That's, that's not the comfort of God. The comfort of God goes deeply into our souls. It touches our, our heart of hearts. And it washes away our fears and our anxieties. It, it washes us away and it gives to us peace. His mercies have given us His power. Romans chapter 1, 16, he's given us power for living. Again, power over sin, power over Satan, power of the world, power to live victoriously. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Power for living. His mercies have given us hope. Romans chapter 5 and 8, he's given us hope for tomorrow, hope for the future, hope beyond death, hope for eternity, hope for something wonderful, something incredible, something amazing, something astonishing, something tremendous. His mercies have given us tremendous patience. He is patience with us. 
Romans chapter 9 through 11, it talks about the forbearance and the long-suffering of the Lord. Haven't you noticed that the long-suffering? I am amazed at the Lord's love in my life of how patient and how long-suffering he is with a stunad like me. Remember that last week, man, when you guys, I was trying to get your attention, and you're all looking one way, and they're all looking one way, and I'm like yelling and screaming trying to get their attention, and I said, hey, stunads, they all turned around. That's because your wife probably has told you that before. Well, I'm a stunad. And it's amazing how patient God is with us, like a father with a child. You know, he won't ask you to sprint before he's taken you and he taught you how to crawl. He'll teach you how to crawl, then he'll teach you how to walk. And he's not going to ask you to run until you've learned how to walk. And he won't ask you to sprint until you've learned how to run. And he's incredibly patient with us. And that's his mercies. The, mer the mercies of God can be seen in his kindness. In Romans chapter 2, verse 4, it says his kindness leads to what? Repentance. His kindness, his love, his, his compassion leads to repentance. Here's, here's one that, that, that amazes me. God extends to us his mercy and he shares his glory with us. He shares his glory. You know what it says in Isaiah? I will not share my glory with any, but he will share his glory with his children. And chapter 2, chapter 5, chapter 8, chapter 9 of Romans, he, he says, I will share my glory. And you know what? You can have a taste of that glory now. You can have a little appetizer of that glory right now. And it's really incredible. But in the next life, we're going to have the full buffet. We're going to have the buffet and we're going to feed on that. You know, Jesus said, he talked about in his death and what he would bestow upon us. And in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, it says that, that we shall be like him. That doesn't mean we're going to be gods, but right, we're going to be glorified. We're going to have glorified bodies, we're going to have glorified souls, and we're going to have glorified spirits. We've gone through this in Romans a number of times. It tells us in chapter 2, verse 10, that he shares his honor with us. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. He gives to us his honor. And in Romans chapter 8, he gives to us his presence. Right? What shall separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Shall tribulation, shall, shall demons, shall, shall trials, shall anything... And he gives to us his presence, that we could walk in his presence, his, his loving presence, his empowering presence, his glorious presence every day. So in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, again, in view of God's mercy, in view of God's mercy, what do you concentrate on in your life? What do you think about most in your life? We call it single-minded devotion in athletics. But when you focus on his mercy, it brings tremendous blessings. Let me just go over this real quick. His mercies, love, grace, the Holy Spirit, peace, faith, comfort, power, hope, patience, kindness, his presence, his glory, his honor. Paul lays out all those mercies of God through chapter 1 through chapter 11 in this marvelous book of Romans. And he says, now, now in view of that, focus on that. Think about it because it brings you blessing. Have you ever heard the saying, the mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell or a hell of heaven? See, people, people who focus on darkness, people who focus on evil, people who focus on sin, they focus on their selfishness, their problems, they, 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 just, they develop a, a hellish mind. Their mind is filled with uh, confusion. Their mind is filled with unrest. Their mind is filled with anxiety. Their mind is filled with unhappiness, with frustration. And then you see somebody who, who is focused on the Lord and they're focused on his mercies. They're focused on his love. They're focused on his will. They're focused on his way. They're focused on his way. And you'll see that they're in a place of peace. They're in a place of joy. You ever go to a, 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 an event a football game or some type of an event and you have to go to the bathroom. You know, it's like a country fair or giant game. And uh, when you're outside the stadium and you have to go to the bathroom, right, they have these things called porta potties I mean, you're like, you have to go so bad, you feel like you're going to die, and then you go in the porta potty and you wish you were dead. <laughs> I'm just thankful I'm a man because I feel sorry for the women because they got to sit down on those things. And the women are going, no, 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 no. 
You know, some people's are, their, their, their minds are like porta potties. They're like porta potties. I'm telling you, after after doing this, after doing this for 37 years, even before I was in, I was I was a pastor. When I was in the fitness business, I'm telling you, people come and sit with you. Some people's minds are like porta potties. The psychologists tell us that 85% of the average person's thinking is either negative or aimless. 85% of what's going on in a person's brain continuously during the day is either negative or aimless. The negativity, anxious thoughts, fearful thoughts, angry thoughts, chaotic thoughts, selfish thoughts, frustrating thoughts. Stop and and ask yourself this question. What happens to you when you don't get what you want? You know, one of the secrets of living a a joyful life is learning that every day there are going to be things that you're not going to get that you want. But what happens to you when you don't get what you want? You explode? You get angry? How about you go, you go into a simmering state for days, weeks, sometimes months? How long does it take for you to get out of that state? An hour? A day? A week? Some people, they never get out of it. They go through life pouting and sulking. How about just your, your thoughts? Are they, are they honed in? Do you, have, do you have some single-mindedness on what you focus on? Or are they just aimless? You just go through the day and it's just it's one aimless thought after another. Maybe you're experiencing it right now. Just, you're, you know, you're thinking about this and then all of a sudden you're thinking about something happened to you in seventh grade and then you're thinking about the Yankee game last night and then you're thinking about a baseball game you played when you were in sixth grade. And, right, and you just go bing, 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 bing. That's how most, pe- that's how most people go through their, their life. How about your first thought or first thoughts of the day? You wake up in the morning, what's your first thought? Coffee, right? (laughs) A nation of of addicts. Coffee, caffeine. Or maybe you wake up and say, oh, another day. Oh, just one more hour of sleep. Oh, I got that meeting today. I got that test today. Oh, my neck, my, my neck, my neck hurts. Today's going to be one long day. Tomorrow morning. Oh, it's Monday. And we missed the mark before we've ever got out of bed. Then you get down and you get your coffee. And you turn on Facebook. Or you open an email. Or you look at your bank statement. That guy, I can't believe it. That guy emailed me again today. That guy annoys me so much. You go on Facebook and, and there's like your arch enemy who was once your friend and they're driving their brand new Mercedes and you're driving your jalopy. <laughs> or there's a, an old girlfriend, right? And she's got a brand new boyfriend and he just looks so good. <laughs> or vice versa. <laughs> and there's that person you wanted to you know, unfriend them, and I don't even know how to do that because I'm not on Facebook. You wanted to unfriend. So when you people are trying to get me on Facebook, I'm not on Facebook. But they're on a Caribbean vacation, and you're here in New Jersey, gloomy New Jersey, and it's uh, four below zero outside in February. But it's true, right? First Corinthians chapter three eighteen says this. But we all, with unveiled face. Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. I want you to to look at that. What it's saying is a person can behold the glory of the Lord as they can behold their face in a mirror. So it's a reflection. In other words, we're we're, we're not seeing God face to face. We've got a revelation. That's, that's, That's the reflection. That's what it's saying. But we can see. We can experience the glory of God. When we focus in on the Lord by faith, we can have an experience of his glory. And we can be embraced by his love. We can be embraced by his power. And as we gaze at the Lord, notice what it says, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. That's where we grow. When we are focused on the Lord... That is where we grow. His his power, his spirit is infusing us. It's changing us. It's transforming us. So in view of God's mercy, in view of his glory. Let me just give you a little little lesson. You You know why Christians fall into sin? I'm talking about Christians here. 
Because there's a difference the way a Christian falls into a true born-again Christian, a true Christian who has been born by the Spirit and has the Spirit of God living in them. There's, there's a difference between how they fall into sin and how an unbeliever falls into sin. When I was an unbeliever, I didn't fall into sin. I just lived in sin. It was just, it was just I, I didn't care. I didn't care about, about sinning. I blasphemed the name of the Lord. Take the Lord's name in vain 10,000 times a day. Never bothered me. Never felt conviction. I could lie and never felt conviction. Steal something, never felt conviction. Just worried just as long as the cops don't catch you, right? I didn't steal anything that was going to put me in jail. Maybe get a misdemeanor. I wasn't going to get felonies. But look at what 2 Peter says, why, why Christians fall into sin. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 8 through 9. For if these things are yours, and he's talking about all these great things, these great blessings that God has given us. He says, if these things are yours and abound, you will neither uh, be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness. And notice what he says. He has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. You know what that's called? Spiritual amnesia. We forget what he's done for us. We forget who we are in Christ. We, we forget that we're children of God. We forget that we are his saints. We forget that we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We forget that we're ambassadors, priests, kings. We forget that he's purified our hearts by faith. And that we are a new creation in Christ and the old is gone and the new has come. And when we forget that, hey, it's happened to me. Believe it or not, you're a holy, holy pastor. Right? And as I like to say, I have more holes in me than most of you in this room. But I can forget. I can experience spiritual amnesia. And all of a sudden, I wonder, why did I do that? Why did I say that? Because I've forgotten. I've forgotten who he is. I've forgotten what he's done. And I've forgotten who I am in him. So in, in, in view of God's mercy... Who better to focus on? Just think about this for a second. All the stuff in this world, all the, the glitter, all the stuff that Hollywood throws at us, right? Everything that, that Washington throws. I mean, who better to focus on than God made flesh? The Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And what better to focus on than the greatest event in human history? In all of history, his death and his resurrection, he died in my place. Want to experience the love of God? He died for me. Has anybody ever died for you? And he was raised from the dead to give us life. And to focus on the master teacher, the greatest teacher who has ever taught anything. Look, if I was to extract all the red letters of the Gospels, it looks like something like that. And um, he has been the greatest teacher and influencer on the world. No one comes close. And you can take Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates, who are considered three of the great early philosophers, and you can have volumes. Who has had a greater influence on the world, Jesus or Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates? What better to focus on than his word? What better to focus on than the best friend you will ever have? The best friend, the greatest friend. What better to focus on than the greatest father, Abba, who loves you, who has compassion for you, who has kindness for you? And what better to focus on than the greatest helper? He will help you with everything you're going through. He will help you with every challenge you have. He will help you with every goal that you have in your life. And who better to focus on than him who is ever extending his mercies towards you 24-7. You know, it says in Ecclesiastes, his mercies are new every morning. You know what I found? They're new every afternoon and evening too. Let me just say this to you. I can do all things with him in mind. I'm not talking about accomplishing. I'm just saying, it doesn't matter what I do. I can have him in mind. It's kind of an interesting thing. And it's, it says that the mind can only hold one thought at a time. But I can be doing this and be in thought of Jesus. I can be preaching and being in thought of Jesus or teaching and being in thought of Jesus. I could be working out in the gym and being in thought of, of Jesus. I could be striking. Ace, I could be striking bags. I, I could even be doing knife fighting and, and be thinking about Jesus. I don't know, it sounds crazy, right? I'm not trying to kill anybody, you know, but we're just training. But I can be doing all those things things and be thinking and have Jesus in mind. Is there anyone better to keep in mind in 
to keep in your mind's eye and to focus on than Jesus? So he says, in view of God's mercy, then he says, present your body. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, the second part, that you present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Present your body. That's a, that's a temple term. It's talking about a person bringing the lamb into the temple to offer it up. You'd bring in the lamb. You'd bring in the best lamb, the spotless lamb, the perfect lamb. You're giving your best, but it's about surrendering up, yielding up, offering up yourself, holding nothing back. That's real worship, by the way. Hope you understand this. That real worship is not liturgy. Real worship is not rituals. Real worship is not candles. Real worship is not stained glass windows. It's nothing external. Real worship is giving oneself to God. Now, I see people come to this church. We were talking about this in our prayer time last week. And by the way, we have a prayer time upstairs at 9.30 in the morning, each Sunday morning. Ladies, you're welcome to come too. We're praying for our nation right now because our nation is on the verge of a revolution or a civil war. And we're praying right now for our nation. On uh, November 1st, Friday night, we're going to call a, a holy convocation. We're going to call a prayer meeting for our nation on Friday, November 1st here at the church. And it's going to be devoted to just praying for our nation. I'm telling you, we are in frightening times. If the Marxists take over this country, you know what they did in the Soviet Union? First of all, they shut the churches down. Anybody who was preaching the gospel, they shut down. And right now, you have a lot of the Marxist leaders on the left talking about, basically, if the church doesn't do what they want them to do in marrying homosexuals, they uh, are going to take away tax-exempt status. Let me go to a home church. We're in home churches. But there'll be loads of churches that are open because they're going to do that. But the true church will be underground. And then another thing that, that they're advocating is if you teach your children about Jesus, they'll come and take your children away and put them into camps with them. That's what, that's what they did in, in, in the Soviet Union. The, the death of the Soviet Union has just been resurrected in progressivism in the United States. We need to pray. We, we, we need to be people of, uh, of prayer. And we need to be interested. I'm concerned not so much about me. Man, I can go right now. I'm concerned about my kids and my grandkids. And I'm concerned about all the children in this church and the young people in this church. Wow, the God just had me say that. But people come to church. Let me say this to you. People come to church to get. And a lot of times they leave getting nothing. And I can assure you of this. If you came here to get, you're going to leave here with nothing. But it's not about getting. It's coming to give. It's coming to offer yourself. That when you come and offer yourself to God, what you're going to find is you're going to walk out with, with a bounty. You're going to walk out with abundance. But it's, it's as we give that we get. Jesus laid, laid that principle out over and over and over again. What you sow is what you reap. Sow nothing, you get nothing. So I people, I'll see people coming to this church for years. They come to get. I want to get. I want to get. I mean, they just buy into the, That's the whole American materialist mentality. Getting, getting, getting. It's about accumulating. So they come to the church and they want to get. And they could be here. They're looking for healing or they're looking for peace, or they're looking for joy, they're looking, but you need to come here and give yourself to Jesus, offer yourself to Jesus, because he's already given himself for you, and you'll walk out with an abundance. So present your bodies as living sacrifices, as the Jewish people did during the temple time, they'd go in again, and they'd offer up the best lamb. Present your bodies as living sacrifices. Let me make this very simple. Let me give you a couple of things here, just looking at our bodies. And it's talking about the physical body. We'll get into the mind next week. We'll get into the will, we'll get into the attitude, but just, just our bodies. Present your eyes. In Psalm 123, verse 2, Behold, as the eyes of the servant look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of the maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy on us. The picture here is of a servant, and they would always be looking at the right hand of the master or the mistress. They're looking at the hand, and what would happen is the, the master would say, you know, he'd point to something, and then you go get it, right? He'd, point, he'd, he'd say here, or he'd be at dinner, and he'd say, he, you know, he'd look out and he'd say, he's all done. They come and they clean the plate. That, that's the picture. They're always watching the hand. Now, we can't see God. I can't see his hand. I know one day in Daniel chapter 5, Belshazzar, right, the hand suddenly appeared and wrote on the wall and said, many, many, take a Parsons. You're done. 
I would paraphrase, he says, you're done, pal. But the one thing we can look to is we can look to his word. To look at his word, to look at his revelation, this supernatural book, right? It's a supernatural book that comes from another dimension outside of our four-dimensional universe. It's supernatural. I shouldn't say it's one book because it's 66 books written over the course of 2,000 years by 39 different authors and is God's personal revelation to us. Really, in a sense, God's personal love letter to us. And, and in his word, right, you will find the answers. You know all those questions and those answers that we have as human beings? Where did I come from? Where am I going? Who's up there? What is he like? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why does evil happen? What's the meaning of life? What's the purpose of life? You'll find all those answers in that book. He addresses it right to our hearts. But you can fix your eyes. Hey, think about things that you're looking at. What are some things that you... I mean, the average American right now, I think this is in the church, 40 to 50 hours in front of a television. Don't you think God is going to have something to say about that? That you had his word right here in your hands? And there are people in other parts of the world who don't have their wor the word of, the, of God in their hands? And we spend all this time looking at these stupid things, the stupid Hollywood stuff, that they sitcoms and these stupid reality shows. I mean, sometimes, you know, it just, it's kind of revealing what's inside of you. Present your hands. Psalm 47, verse 1. Oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Clap your hands. It's an amazing thing. You know, when I, when I first went to a, a, a clapping church, because I was in a church where everybody stood like, in fact, they didn't even stand. They just sat like that. Nobody sang. The choir got up. They rang bells and they sang. And everybody just sat there. If somebody said amen, they would have all fell over and died. <laughs> so I went to a clapping church. My wife said, let's go to this church. It's got a little more life. And we went to Maranatha. And uh, it was in New Milford at the time. And it was like a 110 degree day. We're sitting in the back of the church. We're sweating like crazy. And I see these people clapping. And I was like, geez, you know, I'm just my hands, you know, kind of like inhibited. You know how people are? They're inhibited. They're afraid of what people think about them. At that time, I was like, oh, you know, if I clap my hands, they'll think I'm crazy. They'll think I'm a fanatic. So I just kind of sat there and I refused to clap my hands. But amazingly, something was happening. All of a sudden, my hands started, I don't know, it was like this. And all of a sudden, I, I went like that. <laughs> this, there was nobody behind me, thank goodness. They didn't see me and they thought I was crazy. By the way, as you walk with the Lord, you know what you come to? You come to a place where you don't care what people think about you. I don't care what people think about me. I want to tell you that honestly. I don't care what people think about me. I don't even care what I think about myself. The only thing that matters is what God thinks about me. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We just start using my hands to praise the Lord. You're not going to die. Don't worry. Don't worry about what people around you because they're as weird as you are. <laughs> How about lifting up holy hands? 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, I desire therefore that the men pray in every place, lifting up holy hands without wrath and disputing. So I go, I go to a revival meeting in New York, and uh, I'm like way up in the balcony, and I'm standing there, and I see people going like this. And again, now, I, I started clapping my hands, but I never lifted my hands to the Lord. And the church I was going to, they clapped their hands, but nobody lifted their hands. And I'm standing there, and I'm like, Jesus, all these people lifting their hands. And, and I'm like, I can't do that. That's, that's really strange. That's odd. Kind of fanatical to lift your hands like that and have that kind of expression to God. So I'm standing there, and all of a sudden, my right hand starts to go up. And I went, like, I went like this. So I'm holding it down. And all of a sudden, my left hand started to go up. And then I grabbed it, and I get it down. Then I decided, you know what? Okay, I, I could do this. Because I did see some people, they were one-hand raisers, you know, and they're, they're going like this. So I said, okay, I, I can lift my hand. I'm not waving it. I'm not waving it like I'm, I'm directing the 747 right into, into Newark Airport. But I just said I could hold up my hand there. And I held up my hand for a while, and I just kept it up. And then amazingly, the other hand began to go up. I was in a meeting one night with Carmen Mercadante, who was our speaker last week, Pastor Carmen from Calvary Chapel, and with Jerry Palmieri. Jerry led me to the Lord. Jerry, football coach with the Giants. Jerry was, uh, at one time, he was um, ranked second in the world as a boxer. Carmen was ranked, I think, sixth in the world as a wrestler. These guys were like the best, you know, they were really up there. And um, we're worshiping, and all of a sudden, I'm looking at them, and Jerry's on one side, and he's like this. Carmen's on the other side, he's like this. And I said, what the heck? And all of a sudden, I went like that. <laughs> Just lift your hands. To the, why, do, why do we do that? Why do we lift our hands? Well, well, you just think about this. Like, if somebody stuck a gun in your chest, what would you do? You go, surrender, Lord. 
I'm surrendered to you. Another thing, just look at a little child. My grandson, when he went to go, go to see him in the nursery, he comes running up to me. We reach up to Abba. Shows our love, shows our affection, shows our surrender to him. Here's another passage about hands. Mark chapter 16, 17 to 18. And these signs shall follow them that believe they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Laying hands on people. Now, this, this can be somewhat terrifying to people. The idea I'm going to lay hands on you. It was never meant to be like that. And some people like these over dramatize the idea, hey, come up here, I'm gonna I'm gonna lay hands on you. You're in the nursing home, you're in the hospital. Somebody comes up to you and they, they look at you and they say, Hey, uh, I'm going through a really hard time. Let me lay my hands on that's not that's not it. <laughs> it's kind of simple. It's it's just touching the person. You know, you are a conduit of the Spirit to flow through you in His power and His love and His grace and His healings. There's nothing, uh, com- you know, complicated about it. You know, the little babies after World War II, they were orphans and they were all dying in the hospitals down in the uh, Philippines and in the Pacific and they couldn't figure out why they were dying. They gave them the best medicine, the best food. They were giving them the best medical attention and these little kids, these little babies were dying and dying and dying. And then they figured out, they brought all of these wax, right? Those are the nurses. They brought the, the nurses out into the, uh, out into the Pacific Islands and all the nurses would do is just hold the babies every day and they all got well. We have a need to be held and touched. And when you just reach out, it's amazing how people respond. I go to hospitals, and when I ask somebody if I can pray for them, I've only once had somebody say no. Only once. Probably thousands of times. How about your face? Present your face, right? I selected that because I like that. That guy is saying, what? What's up? What? What? What's up? That commercial, they don't play that anymore. In the scriptures, Moses and Aaron fell to the ground with their faces to the ground. Just a, it, it's a picture of just surrender and giving God the glory. Numbers chapter 20, verse 6. So Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and they fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. How about just presenting your comfort? Right? We like the comfort of our bodies, right? How many of us, does anybody here not like comfort? You're a masochist, you're crazy. We like our easy chairs, we like our big screen TVs, right? We like our comfortable beds. I like a car seat that's comfortable. We like comfort. But just to to offer up your comfort, to be inconvenienced. When I I went to Pastor Rizzo and I said to him, I'm called to preach and teach the gospel. You know what he said to me? Come to the church every Saturday and clean the bathrooms. And every Saturday for two years I went to the church and cleaned the bathrooms. For he who is faithful with little will be given more. But I gave up. I was inconvenienced. It's kind of inconvenient, right, to clean a bathroom. In Mark chapter 10, 34 to 35, it talks about the Good Samaritan. It says, so he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal. That always made, like, right, he set him on the animal, so now he had to walk. And brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him and whatever more you spend when I come again, I will repay you. How about presenting your back? Kind of simple here. Psalm chapter 95, 6 in the NIV. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. Just simply a humble... I don't, I don't bow before men and I won't bow before men. I wouldn't bow before the president. I will not bow before a king. And you can kill me before I will ever bow before you. But I will bow before the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Romans 2.11 says, work hard and do not be lazy. Serve the Lord with a heart full of devotion. Notice this. The first part is work hard and don't be lazy. The second part is it's an expression of your heart. But just serving God, working. Use your backbone. Use your backbone to serve the Lord. How about present your mouth? Presenting your mouth just, just by witnessing and sharing the gospel. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in, uh, to me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Just, just sharing the love of God 
the good news with people from your mouth, offering up your mouth to the Lord. Every once in a while I hear somebody say, I let my life witness. If maybe if you're one of those people, can I just ask you this? You're such a, uh, your, your life is such a great witness that you don't even need to share the gospel with anybody. People just fall down and accept Jesus just by watching you. Does anybody have, has, have you ever had that experience? I haven't seen it. And your life should be a witness. That should be what backs up your, your words. But I don't know about you. Uh, just, I, I have to share the gospel with people for people to really understand the gospel and come to Jesus. How about just offering up with your mouth praise? My lips will praise you. How about presenting your ears to the Lord? Just listening to the word of God. Lenny, our worship leader. Lenny's an amazing young man. He really is. He's gone through a number of trials and um, has been incredibly faithful through the years. He's been with me since the early days of the ministry. Lenny's a very successful engineer. I mean, his, his, he, he, he builds stadiums. He builds bridges. He builds dams. builds big things. And um, at, the, uh, at the retreat... I'm talking with him, and uh, he tells me about, he's got this Bible app on his phone, and he listens to the Bible, somebody reading the Bible, when he's going back and forth in the car, and he's like a little kid on Christmas Day, just totally excited about just hearing the Word of God on his Bible app. I mean, you're like a little kid. <laughs> he's like all excited. That's what Jesus does for you. He makes us like little children. But he's been, he's been in the Lord for 30 years. He's, he's been here as a, a worship leader for almost 30 years. And just, like, he's an elder in the church. And he's still excited about just listening to the word, offering his ears. How about present your feet? In Romans chapter 10, 15, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Just going to where God wants you to go. Doing what God wants you to do. How about presenting your knees? Just offering your knees to the Lord. Ephesians chapter 3, 14 and 15. I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. Just getting down on your knees. Listen to what Denzel said. If, if you won't believe the Holy Spirit today, then believe Denzel. <laughs> he says, I pray that you all put your shoes way under the bed at night so that you got to get on your knees in the morning to find them. And while you're down there, thank God for grace and mercy and understanding. We all fall short of the glory. We all got plenty. Isn't that a great idea? That's just ingenious, Denzel. <laughs> just stick your shoes under the bed and you got to get on your knees every morning. Let me give you one more. And then I'll close. Present your butts. Now, most of the time when I talk about butts, you know, I'm talking about all the excuses that people have. But, but I can't, but I'm too tired, but my wife, I mean, man, when they say, but my wife won't let me. My wife won't let me go on the retreat. <laughs> but I'm watching a Netflix series and I can't give it up. I'm watching that reality show and I just can't give it up. But, but, but. So that's not the butt I'm talking about. The butt I'm talking about, now I'm really talking about the butt that's on the back of your body. <laughs> Offer up our butts. Mark chapter 10, 39, it says of Mary, and she and her sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Just sitting at Jesus' feet. I just want to tell you this. I'll be just... My yes is yes, my no is no, of everything I do. And as I go through the week, you know, there's praise and there's witnessing and there's teaching and there's preaching and there's kneeling and there's, there's lifting up of hands and there's laying on of hands and there's praying for people and there's giving to people and there's falling on my face. But the most enjoyable thing that I do all week is to sit on my butt at the feet of the Lord and talk to Him and hear his voice through his word and commune with him and just be bathed in his love and in his grace and in his mercy and his spirit and his power. It's like liquid love just flowing over my... There's nothing that I enjoy more. I just want to confess that to you than offering up my butt to the Lord 
and just sitting at his feet and looking into his beautiful face. So let me give you the application here and I'll wrap up, right? In view of God's mercy. And again, Jesus is the mercy of God. He is the love of God. He is the grace of God. He is the compassion, the comfort, the kindness, the goodness, the favor of God. Here's a little poem. Can I share with you a poem that I wrote? It's only 15 pages long. No, no, it's... I wrote this a number of years ago. If you want to be distracted, look around. If you want to be discouraged, look down. If you want to be depressed, look within. And if you want to be in despair, look back. If you want to be empowered, encouraged, and enlightened, look up into the wonderful face of Jesus. Just, just fix your eyes on him. Right? Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Fix your eyes. You know, that was instilled in me early on in my walk by my pastor. He said to me, you keep looking at people, you're going to be discouraged. Or just look at people. You look at people in the church, you get discouraged. Look at people in the world, you get discouraged. You look at the politicians, you get discouraged. He said, fix your eyes on Jesus. If you fix your eyes on Jesus, he said, you will live in continuous joy and peace. And in view of God's mercies in Jesus, then present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. You know what my prayer was after I got saved that I have prayed consistently for 37 years? God, make my life count for you. Just make my life count. I, I know I'm not, look, um, I'm nobody. I'm nobody special. But just take me and make my life count for you. I want, I want it to count for eternal things, for the kingdom of God, for the making of disciples, for the saving of souls. And I believe, I believe when you present your life to him that way, I'll tell you something, there's, there's a, 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 a comeback and, and an outpouring that he pulls out your life. You will be grateful, you will be thankful, and you will be blessed. And let me say this to you, you will be victorious. You will be victorious. You will be victorious. And you won't live like a victim. So would you bow your heads, we'll close in prayer.
praise to you alone. Because you alone are worthy. God created by our hands, by any human hands, Lord. You are God alone. Before time began, Lord, you are God alone. Hallelujah. Praise your name. You are so worthy, Lord. All creation proclaims your praise, Lord. 